All right, let's let's jump into these exponentials. Uh, we kind of talked about these properties when we when we did the natural logs a couple of days ago. Or if you need to go back and watch go watch those videos, that's okay. But we we should know how to do a lot of the precal stuff for exponentials and logs. And really, we just want to get to the calculus. Like enough of this stuff, Mr. Bell. Just take me to the calculus. Well. We're going to do a little bit of precal just for reviewsies. Uh, remember, we have the log form of an equation and the exponential form of an equation, and you can always switch between the two. If you start with the log, you would write it as b to the y power equals x, uh, right? That's what you have. Or if you have it as an exponential, you could do a log base b of x would be equal to y. There's always that circular type of motion. And the natural log is a log base e. Remember, ln is log base e uh, of x, and then if you ever don't see any base indicated, remember that's your common log, which is base 10. e is the natural base, so ln of e, which is, uh, or log, log base e, which is ln, that's my natural log, 10 is the common base, uh, because, uh, yeah, so, so, we, so the log without any base indicated, that's just log base 10, common log. So if we want to solve one of these equations, however it is you were taught it in Algebra 2 or in Pre-Cal, Basically, the idea is, if I have an exponential, I would want to get that exponent out of, or I need to get that x out of the exponent, right? So I'd have to switch it from an exponential to a log, or vice versa. If I have something that starts with a log, I'm eventually going to want to rewrite it as an exponential. You always are basically going to start it in one form and going to want, if you're solving for the variable, you're going to want to switch it to the other form. Uh, whether it's taking a log on both sides, or whether it's exponentiating, eing both sides, uh, it, it, it's all kind of the same thing, right? Exponentiating both sides, or taking a log on both sides... That's just switching it from one form to the other, right? The Whatever fancy words you want to use on it, that's okay. Whatever makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. Okay, let's go through and let's do these five, and then uh, we'll look at the graphs, and then we'll get into the calculus. Here I've got e to this stuff equals 7. I want to get rid of the e, right? Got to get rid of the e, so I take a natural log on both sides, or I rewrite it as a natural log. I always thought about taking a natural log on both sides, uh, and then here... The ln and the e are going to cancel, leaving me the x plus 1. Then I'd have ln of 7 on the right. But that's the same thing, right? If I were to rewrite this as a log, you'd have a log base e of 7 would equal to this. So whether you take a natural log on both sides, if that's how you want to think about it, fine. Or if you want to just think about switching it from an exponential equation to a log equation, you're going to get the same thing. Okay, so it doesn't matter. And then subtract the 1. Be careful, it's not ln of 6. It's just going to be ln of 7 minus 1. I'm not going to do the decimals. No, I'm just going to leave them exact. Okay, so just be careful, right, the order of operations. That that 1 does not go inside of the, the natural log. Don't, don't make that mistake. Okay, next one, we have uh, a natural log. Uh, remember, that's log base e, so you could think about exponentiating both sides, then those cancel, leaving me the 2x minus 3 equals e to the 5th, or if you have log base e, you would take e to the 5th power equals the stuff inside. So either taking a log on both sides or exponentiating or eing both sides, it's really just switching it from one form of the equation to the other. Right, which is how we solve these equations. Now, everything else is pretty easy. Add the 3, divide by the 2. So here we're going to get 1 half of e to the 5th plus 3. Remember, pi is a number just like e is a number. So e to the 5th is just some weird, ugly number. That's okay. This next one, you have e to the ln of x. Since the e and the ln are right next to each other, right? Since those inverse uh, operations are done subsequently, they would cancel, and you would just straight up get that x is 9. Okay, so that one's nice. The e and the ln cancel, the x doesn't, right? Because how would it, it wouldn't make sense if you just had nothing equals 9. But if the e and the ln are right next to each other, they will cancel, right? If I have e to the ln of x, uh, that will always give you x, right? It's very good. Uh, or if I had something like, where do I, where do, I don't want to take up too much room. I think I'll be okay. If I had something like e to the ln of x squared, uh, we know that would give us x squared. Now, if I had something like this, e to the 2 ln of x, uh, if that 2 was in the way, 
you you would kind of need to move it first because the E and the LN, since they're they're inverse operation, but since they're not right next to each other, they wouldn't cancel. Okay, so even though something like that would work, right? Since the E and the LN are right next to each other, you can't you can't really just say this is two x. You can't just say it's x. You'd have to take this two and you'd have to stick it as an exponent, right? And so here I'd have two uh, two attached to that x, and x squared, uh, and so that one would end up giving you x squared. So e to the 2 ln of x, you'd have to move the 2 first before stuff would cancel. Okay, and let's do one more little example just to help you out on something that may, may come up later. If I have e to the negative ln of 2, what is that going to boil down to? Because I've seen a lot of different things. I've seen the answer to be 2. I've seen the answer to be negative 2. I've seen square root of 2. I've seen all sorts of witchcraft, and it's rare that students get it correct. Okay, what you'd have to do, since this e and the ln, since they have something in between them, you would have to use your property of logs to move that sucker, right? So I would have e to the ln, and I'd have 2 to the negative first power. That means do the reciprocal of 2, so then I would have e to the ln of 1 half, so then it would cancel and it would give me a 1 half as the answer, right? If the e and the ln are right next to each other, they'll cancel. But if there's something in the way, whether it's a 2 or whether it's a negative, you have to use that property of logs to move that thing first. It's a little common question that comes up, and students will usually mess it up, but I don't know, if you know your properties, it's not that bad. All right, two more. Here we go. Divide by 300. So that's all gone. Uh, 200 divided by 300. Zeros are cancel. It's two-thirds. Get rid of the E by taking a natural log on both sides. It is okay to have two-thirds inside of a log. <clears throat> you should always... Hold on just a minute. All right, sorry, my voice is kind of going out and I was going to cough all over the microphone, but I decided not to, so I, I paused it for you. All right, so remember, you should always check whether it's okay to take a natural log on both sides. If you had something like a negative two-thirds... You can't take a natural log, just like how if you had x squared equals negative 4, you wouldn't want to take the square root, because you don't want to fiddle with those imaginary numbers. Uh, but since that's a positive term, it's okay to have that positive term inside of the natural log. Then you would just divide by the, the negative 5, and I would get negative 1 fifth ln of 2 thirds. Now, here's the thing that would trip people up. Right. If you were to actually type all this in uh, to the calculator, you would get 0.081, and you're like... How is it positive, Mr. Bell? Where did the negative go? Well, uh, this part is negative. Now, ln of 2 thirds, remember, if you were to think about that natural log graph, where does it cross? What well, crosses at 1? 2 thirds is before 1. So 2 thirds, ln of 2 thirds would be some point like that, which, which would be negative, since that point is before the x-intercept. This term right here would be negative, and this term and that term's negative, they would cancel. So if you freak out because the, the answer ends up being a positive decimal, you know, that's okay. I would prefer the exact solution anyways. But yes, it should make sense that it's positive. This one's got the negative, obviously. This one's got the negative kind of more subtly, but because that's a number between 0 and 1, remember, cannot have a 0 in inside, cannot have anything negative inside, uh, but if you have some fraction between 0 and 1, or some decimal between 0 and 1, that just means that term is negative, and then the two negatives would cancel. Okay, last one. Here we go. What you would do first is take this chunk, multiply it over, and take 30, so basically those swap, and let's see, uh, I'd have 1,000 over 30 equals 15 plus e to the x over 3, we have a 0 that would cancel, subtract a 15, oops, minus 15, then we would take a natural log, <clears throat> now let's check, we should always make sure that when I took a natural log, we should always check and make sure that that's positive, let's see, 100 over 3, that's about 33.333, and then that's 15. Okay, so that's still positive. Or if you need to, that's 45 over 3. 100 minus 45. Okay, that's 55. So this is 55 thirds positive, right? You don't really need to simplify it. You just need to eyeball test to make sure it is positive. And you just have to multiply the 3 over. So here we'd get 3 ln of 100 thirds minus 15. If you wanted to simplify all that stuff, that's, that's fine. Go for it. I'm not going to. All right, so solving those exponential and log equations should be Hopefully, okay.
And then here's your graph of your exponential, right? Typically would have an x-intercept or a y-intercept at 1, has the horizontal asymptote. Uh, remember, it's, it's the inverse graph of your natural log. Natural log looks like this, it has the vertical asymptote and the x-intercept at 1, so therefore the inverse function should have that reflection over the line y equals x, has the y-intercept, and it has a horizontal asymptote. This one's shifted up 3, so that's great, the asymptote's 3, and then the intercept is 4. This one's got the horizontal reflection, so this is what we would call an exponential decay. Oh, I cannot spell, can I? That would be an exponential decay, uh, whereas these first two, those were exponential growth functions. Uh, but kind of the important things, right, obviously your exponentials, they go up on the right and down on the left, at least for your positive exponentials, for your positive rates. But here, when you have the negative, it's going to go down on the right uh, and then up on the left. Now, let's think about something quickly, right, for just this exponential graph, e to the infinity, this is going to come up in just a little bit when we do limits later on. E to the infinity means, hey, as that graph goes to the right, right, remember, infinity would be really far on the right on your number line, negative infinity would be really far to the left. E to the infinity is basically asking, where is this graph going as it goes to the right? And clearly, that's going to be going up and up and up and up forever and ever and ever. Now, let's think about E to the negative infinity which you could do one of two different ways. If you have your exponential graph, right, that's y equals e to the x. If you have your exponential graph, you're thinking, as my exponential gets really, really, really close to negative infinity, aka, as that graph goes to the left, what value is it going to get closer to? Well, it's a zero, right? As that graph goes towards the left, it's going to be approaching the horizontal aspect, which is zero. Or if you want to think about it like this, e to the negative infinity, that's the same thing as 1 over e to the infinity, which is the same thing as 1 over infinity, and if your denominator gets really, really, really big, then your fraction overall gets really, really, really small. But the right side goes up, the left side ends up going closer to zero. Those are two facts that you really should know, but if you have to think about the graph for your exponential to get them again in the future, that's okay. All right, we got a page and a half now of, of some calculus examples, and I'm going to pause it because my ear is really itchy, and then when, we, when I resume the video, uh, we'll go through, and then we'll, we'll learn how to take the derivative of an exponential. Okay, so let's, let's learn how to take some derivatives of exponentials, and they're going to be easy. I hope you enjoyed the natural logs. Remember, what was inside of the log goes to the bottom, chain rule goes to the top log, should be pretty easy. Uh, and then the exponentials are even easier, okay? If I have the basic parent function, let's do the parent function first, then we'll get to the general rule. If I have an exponential that's just e to the x, the derivative is literally the exact same thing. If you're thinking about the slopes of your exponential functions, they start off really, really, really flat, and then as that graph moves to the right, slopes get a little bit bigger. At this point, right, at this point, the slope of the graph would actually be 1. And then as it moves to the right, it just gets bigger. And the rate at which it gets bigger is equal to the, actually the, the height of that coordinate point. Okay, so the derivative of the exponential function e to the x is just literally the same exact thing. And then if you have to do chain rule, right, so if it's e to the something, the derivative of e to the something is that exact same e to the something. You would just have to remember to do chain rule, either times u prime or times du dx. It's a really nice easy function for us to work with. The derivative of an exponential is itself, and then you just have to worry about what, if anything, kicks out because of chain rule. Okay, let's practice. Here we go. We've got e to the 3x squared. I know the derivative is going to have that exact same thing, e to the 3x squared, so I always just copy, and then I think what is the derivative of that piece that's in the exponent. The derivative of that exponent would be 6x, so then the 6x is just going to kick down because of the chain rule. That's it. The derivative of an exponential, just copy it. It is itself. Then you worry what kicks down to the front because of chain rule. And I typically like to write the chain, the chain rule part in front as opposed to behind, but it's just my own personal preference. Alrighty, next example. We have a product rule. Okay, how fun. It's just wonderful for us. That's okay. The derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second. So the derivative of the second, can you see it? It's going to have e to the negative 2x, but then what would kick out because of the chain rule? A negative 2 
So there's the derivative of the second times the first. You could simplify it if you want. I'm going to leave it like that. <clears throat> okay, the next one, we have a sine squared of e to the x. This one's a three-layer composite. If you need to, just rewrite it like this. You have something squared, then you have a sine of something, then you have that inner piece, which is the exponential e to the x. This is a three-layer composite, which means you have to do chain rule twice. The derivative of something squared is just two times that something, and then whatever was inside is still inside, so that would be sine of e to the x. That layer is accounted for. Move it on over. Next one, the derivative of sine of something is cosine of something. Whatever was inside of the sine is inside of the cosine. Now that layer is accounted for. And then whatever the innermost piece is, there you'd have it. So just chain rule twice. The derivative of both of the inside functions. And then there you'd have it. You could rewrite that as 2. Uh, actually, let's, let's look. Yeah, 2 sine cosine. So you could rewrite this as sine. I guess you'd have the e to the x at the front. Here, let's rewrite it. Am I on the screen? Oh, I am still on the screen. Okay. So you have a trig identity that says sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. It's your double angle. And your double angles in your Pythagoreans, those are really the only ones that come up in your calculus one. But here I've got a 2 sine cosine. So I've got 2 sine stuff, cosine stuff. This, you could fit into that double angle formula. You'd still have the e to the x out on the front, but you could rewrite all the rest of it as sine of 2 e to the x. That's a little sneaky thing, right? The, the multiple choice answer may look something like this. So then you would have to recognize that, hey, because of pre-cal, we have that double angle formula where, where instead of having it as two sine stuff, cosine stuff, you could have it instead as sine of two times the stuff. Uh, so those double angles come up occasionally, right? That's kind of the whole point of your pre-cal class is to teach you how to not be bad at algebra and to teach you the little bit of trigonometry. And we have all those different trig identities and formulas and stuff, the double angles and the Pythagoreans, those are the most important ones. They don't come up a lot, but they, they may come up every once in a while. Okay, let's move it on. Next one, we have ln of stuff. Remember, if we're going to take the derivative, that's no problem. Whatever's inside of the log, just copy and go to the bottom. And then the chain rule will go to the top. The derivative of 5 is 0. The derivative of e to the 4x is going to be 4e to the 4x. Those don't cancel because the 5 doesn't have it, so that's it. That's all you could do. Do not cancel that stuff. That's bad algebra. Okay, and the next one. You could do it a couple different ways. You could think about, hey, what's inside of the log? And then whatever's inside of the log goes to the bottom, and then chain rule goes to the top. So I know that's an exponential. So the same thing would go here. Chain rule says 3x squared would go on the top. Those would reduce. So there you would get 3x squared, right? And that's fine. Or if you wanted to, you could have used your log properties, right? This exponent, you could have just brought it all the way down to the front. Oh my gosh, I cannot write today. Too many videos, sorry. Uh, and so if you bring it down to the front, you have x cubed times ln of e. And remember, ln of e is 1, so you, you really don't need it. That cancels. And then for sure, the derivative of x cubed is also going to be 3x squared. You could have done that either way. Uh, you, you should get the same thing. But yeah, sometimes using the properties makes the calculus a little bit easier. I don't know, take it or leave it. All right, let's do this page and then we'll be done. So again, four more finding, I guess five more finding the derivative, find the derivative, product rule. All right, so we've got the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. And you'd probably just leave it like that. Nothing really you could do. You could factor out an e if you want and have tangent plus secant squared, but that doesn't, that doesn't really help you. Okay, the next one. You have the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second is going to be negative e to the negative x. That negative kicks down because of the chain rule times the first. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could factor out some stuff. Uh, you could leave it like this, or if you wanted to just have 2x e to the negative x minus x squared e to the negative x, like that's fine. Or you could factor out a couple things. You could factor out, uh, I think, an x and an e to the negative x, and you'd have a 2 minus x left over. Like either one of those would be fine, uh, but that's that actually looks a little bit nicer. So factoring it may, may help a little bit. Okay, next one, we have a quotient. So we're going to need to use quotient rule. 
That's fine. We don't enjoy it, but we can do it. The derivative of the top would be 3e to the 3x times the bottom, so e to the 3x plus 4, minus, then I need the derivative of the bottom, which is also 3e to the 3x plus 0 times the top over the bottom squared. So we've got e to the 3x plus 4. Please don't multiply that out. There's no point, right? Every time you do quotient rule, you pretty much always just want to leave it as the bottom squared. Okay, now let's let's distribute the top because some stuff's going to reduce. Here I'm going to have, uh, I'm just going to multiply it all out. So this would be minus, by the way, if you had x squared times x to the fifth, right? If I have two bases that are the same, what would you do with those exponents? So you would add them. Okay, if the base is the same, you add the exponents. Here, those bases are the same. So it is not going to be e to the 9x squared. Okay, uh, if you were to multiply those two things, it would be an e to the 6x. So I'm going to have a minus 3e to the 6x. Then here, you'd have a 3e to the 6x. And then 3 times 4, that would be 12e to the 3x. And then what's going to happen with this chunk? In this chunk. One of them's positive, the other one's negative, so they're going to cancel, and it's going to reduce, and it's 12e to the 3x over whatever that bottom was. So that one is, is a good like multiple choice question. Like when you take the derivative, you, you may very well have something like this, and then you're looking at your answer options, and you're like, mm, none of them kind of look like this. Well, if you distribute, and if you simplify, you'll see that some things cancel. Then you could pick out, hopefully, which one of those answer choices is correct. But you're not usually always done right after the calculus. Sometimes you have to do some algebra to make your answer match one of the six answer options. Okay, uh, let's look at this next one. Uh, please don't take the derivative right now, right? You could. It would involve chain rule, since I've got ln of stuff, and it would involve uh, a quotient rule within the chain rule. Uh, please, please, if you see something like this, use your log properties. That's the same thing as ln 3 plus e to the x minus ln of 3 minus e to the x. You can use your log properties, and you can split it up. Since it's division inside of the log, you can easily split it up. No problem. Okay, now let's go ahead and take these two of us. Oh my gosh, I'm tired. Whatever's inside of the log goes to the bottom. Chain rule goes to the top. Easy. Whatever's inside of the log goes to the bottom. The chain rule goes to that. Now, the derivative of that zero, the derivative of this is going to be negative e to the x. So you can, instead of writing negative e to the x, I'm going to change it, right? The double negative. There we have it. Now, if that's not your multiple choice answer, that's okay. You could you could do your fast adding trick. This does end up giving you 6e to the x over 9 minus e to the 2x. Uh, if you want to see the algebra as to why that is the way it is, uh, it's basically doing your fast adding tricks. You'd cross multiply to get the top, multiply across to get the bottom. Here, I'll put it underneath the screen just really quickly. If you want to, uh, you can pause it and you can you can look at it. Uh, that's that's not a bad answer. If you wanted to actually combine the two fractions, uh, you could you could get it, but I don't know. Like, that's fine for me, but if it was a multiple choice question, you may have to do the work to just simplify it, but oh well. All right, the fifth one, part E, we're almost done. Fifth one, part E, says, remember, all these instructions were to take the derivative. So this is going to be a second FTC question. Those sneak up quite a bit. When I take the derivative of an integral, remember that 3 doesn't matter, I'm just going to take this thing and plug it in everywhere I see a t. So I'm going to have tangent of e to the 5x. But then I know I would need to do chain rule because the derivative of that thing that I plugged in, it's not 1. So I would have a 5e to the 5x. That would kick out because of the chain rule. And remember, if those had just been switched, the only thing you would need is the extra negative. Okay, write the equation of the tangent line. So be it. y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. Now to get the m value, I'm going to take this derivative which is 2e to the 2x. I'm off the screen. Let's rewind. Let's kind of get it back on the camera. Okay, I'm delirious today. Oh, well. No one's probably watching the video anyways. Uh, and then, let's see. I take the derivative, and then I would plug in the x value. So I'd take that derivative, and I would plug in 0. So 2e to the 2 times 0 
e to the 2 times 0, that's 0, e to the 0 power is 1, so that's 2 times 1, so the whole thing just ends up being uh, 2. So here's my m value, go plug it in, and then bam, there's your equation of the tangent line. You can simplify it if you want, you would get y equals 2x plus 1, but typically they would want you to leave it in point-slope form. To get it into slope-intercept, you'd have to distribute and then just take that number and add it or subtract it over, but typically point-slope form is just fine. Two more questions. Okay, here we got an implicit differentiation, and that's okay. The next one also, uh, let's go for it. So I've got x cubed, the derivative of x cubed, I know it's uh, 3x squared, and then the derivative of x e to the y, oh, here we go, the derivative of the first, let's do this, this is product rule, right, product rule for here. The derivative of the first is 1 times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. I'm going to just copy the first. Right, so that piece is right here, then the product rule is what I'm writing out here, the derivative of the first times the second, plus, I still haven't done the derivative of the second, but I'm about to, times the first, which I just copied, now let's go do the derivative of e to the y, the derivative of e to the y is e to the y, y prime, and then the derivative of minus uh, y to the fifth is going to be minus 5y to the fourth, y prime, of course, that's equal to zero, so here's my two derivative terms, so I'm going to keep those, move the other ones over. So here I'm going to have x e to the y, y prime minus 5, y to the fourth, y prime. Those are my two derivative terms. The other ones, I'm going to move them over. So negative 3x squared minus e to the y. You would factor out that e to the, you'd factor out the y prime. And then this whole chunk would divide over. Okay, so all that piece is going to divide over. You have x e to the y minus 5y to the fourth. And that's like a perfectly good answer. You probably wouldn't see that as the answer on the AP exam because three out of the four terms are negative. Remember, you could just change all of the signs and then it would be just, just fine, right? Uh, so let's, let's, let's change these signs. So I would have 3x squared plus e to the y. And then here, I'm going to flip the order also. So I'd have a 5y to the fourth minus an x e to the y. Those two things are the same, right? They're mathematically equivalent. That one's just, I don't know, looks nicer because three of the four terms are positive instead of three of the four terms being negative. But remember, if you multiply by a negative one on the top, multiply by a negative one on the bottom, or if you factor out the two negatives and then cancel them, right? As long as you change all of the signs for all four chunks, you will get an equivalent answer. But in, in the AP exam kind of likes the ones that are mostly positive. And I, I do too, like I would rather work with something that's three quarters positive than three quarters negative. Uh, and you probably should also, seeing based on how many mistakes people make with, with simple negatives. All right, last one, I think for today, and then we'll, we'll be done. Here we go, I've got e to the xy. I know the derivative of an exponential is itself. And then here I'm gonna have the, pr uh, the product rule in the chain rule. So here I have e to the xy, the derivative of an exponential is itself, and then I will need to do the product rule of x times y, the derivative of the first times the second, plus the derivative of the second times the first. So there's my product rule for x times y, the derivative of the first times the second, plus the derivative of the second times the first. There we go, then plus 2x minus 2y, y prime is going to be equal to 0. Now this you will need to distribute, so I'm going to have a y e to the xy plus an x e to the xy, y prime, plus 2x minus 2y, y prime. Those are my two derivative terms, so I'm going to keep them. Actually, yeah, let's, let's, let's move those over. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave these on the left. So I've got y e to the xy plus 2 to the x. Now when I move this over, it's going to become positive. When I move this over, it's going to become negative. Then I would need to factor out the y prime. So let's look, factor it out. There we go. And then you would divide by this chunk. So then you would end up getting that y prime is equal to, here's the numerator, y e to the xy plus 2x over 2y minus x e to the xy. And because I took those two terms and I left them, notice those two were already positive, 
right? So if you look at this, I got three of the terms that are positive, one of them's negative. If I were to have taken the, the non-derivatives and moved them over, then they would have been negative, which means I would have ended up with the ones that would have had three negative terms, like those would have been negative and that one would have been positive. So I kind of just planned it. I was like, hey, look, those two things, which are going to end up in the numerator either way, since they're already positive, right, let me just move those over, so that way the numerator stays positive and you get the majority positive answer. Uh, but, you know, that's not the only correct way of writing the answer. There's, there's other equivalent forms of it, but that's probably, I think, the nicest way.